Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very much to uh, the foundation for uh, sponsoring the talk tonight and having me here. How many of you have been, I have not been to this library since before, you know, COVID. So, but I think I was here at least twice before that. Anybody at one of my talks previously? Oh, yeah. a few. Not enough, but, um, but that's nice. So it's good to be back here. Um, I got to tell you, I, you know, travel all over New England. <clears throat> and I was just thinking, as I was driving here tonight in this area, I have never been lost as badly. <laughs> Any, and I'm talking about driving through northern Maine. It doesn't matter. I have never been as lost. See, now it's all coming back up for me. I have never, ever been as lost anywhere in New England as I was my first time here. And I left, and I remember, and the funny thing is, I must have had maps going or GPS or something, but I remember I was leaving and I asked some folks, we were doing it in that, that senior room, right, where they were, right? And, uh, and I said, uh, you know what, quickly, I said, I can use GPS, but I said, you know, I always like to ask folks, because they might know a great shortcut that's not even on, you know. So I'm going, I said, I'm heading back home to Holliston, and I figure I could get, find my way, you know, I could get over to 24 eventually, maybe hit 495, or I could go out 27 and go through all the way through Natick. That's totally fine, too. And so then these two folks in line started arguing with each other. <laughs> That's stupid. You're right at the Gulf. Take a right. And I was like, I'm screwed. So um, I left, and I was picking my way, and within... First of all, I got to Pembroke. I was, okay, this is not the right direction. So, because I needed to go southwest. So then about 15 minutes later, all signs of humanity seemed to have vanished. And I was in some big swamp. <laughs> and you know what occurred to me? I was like, this is the Bridgewater Triangle. <laughs> and I'm going to disappear and become a statistic. And I was like in Halifax or something. Yes, yes. Oh my God, it's crazy down here. So really, it's a long way of asking for somebody to lead me home. When I leave, would anybody? No, I'm kidding. Anyway, I'm so happy to be back here. And I'm glad you all came out. How many of you were planning to come last week when it got snowed out? Even though the, then there was like four, two and a half you know, centimeters of snow. But um, that's what the people in my profession do. They, uh, they get people all whipped up, and then it doesn't even happen. Thanks for coming out. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, my most recent book, which is now uh, two years old. Uh, but it's the first time I'm talking here about it. I kind of was overhearing some stuff. Some people were talking about having been at Cooperstown. And hey, who was that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming there's some baseball interest here. That's definitely a part of this talk. But you know, the thing is, I'm, I bet I'm not alone in, um, in this room in being somebody who who likes history. And one of the things that's always fascinated me about history and how it's taught, how we learn it, how we perceive it, is that we very often think we know something, maybe too much, about a certain historical, it could be a historical event, it could be a person, it could be an achievement, it could be an invention, it could be anything. And especially as the event becomes further and further back in time, we actually don't know as much as we think we do. Or we may have misunderstood something to begin with, or it's not taught well, which is really partly the case here, um, or as fully, or the context is not taught as fully, or some of the people who are part of the story somehow never get taught. That's what this is. And I'm going to illustrate my point. Okay? I'm going to illustrate my point by starting off with a question. Now, bear with me, because I know this is a brand new toy here at the library. And I get to be the lucky one who's dealing with some of the little kinks here that we dealt with before most of you were in the room for the last half hour. So I think this, uh... ah, OK. I feel like I should be doing the weather. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> all right. So I'm going to illustrate my, the point I just made with the question. After Jackie Robinson, it's also like a magic wand. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, anybody have a guess as to who was the second black major league ball player? Yes, sir. Larry Joby. Larry Joby. Boy, they said it together. Larry Joby is a great guess. 
That's a great guess. Right in the ballpark, Larry Doby is totally part of this story. Larry Doby's a good guess. Anybody else have a guess? It wasn't Pumsy Green, was it? Pumsy Green comes a little bit later, but I know why you're thinking of Pumsy Green, because Pumsy Green was the first black Red Sox player. Yeah. Yes, but that's about a decade and a half later. But, but Larry Doby's right in the ballpark, time-wise. Satchel Page is a good one. Satchel Page, huge part of this story, as you're going to see. So Larry Doby and Satchel Page are great guesses, both wrong. Because the thing, it proves my point, because it, it's a bit of a trick question. Because after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, the second black major league ball player was Jackie Robinson. Because Jackie Robinson did not do the thing you think he did. Jackie Robinson did not integrate Major League Baseball. He reintegrated Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball had been integrated 60 plus years before Jackie Robinson by this man who does not want to respond <laughs> to all of my ministrations who you probably haven't heard of. Moses Fleetwood Walker. Moses Fleetwood Walker was, he integrated Major League Baseball 60 plus years before Jackie Robinson. And most people have never heard the name Moses Fleetwood Walker. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the story around the integration of baseball, that the fall of the color barrier, was much different than we think because Jackie Robinson didn't integrate. He was reintegrating it. It had all been integrated. So it tells us that not only is that story a little bit different, but also baseball was a little bit different because baseball was an outlier. You know, I'm going to have a swollen wrist by the time this is done. Um, because baseball was a little bit of an outlier, right? Baseball, as it began to grow, baseball really begins to grow. Look, they're playing baseball of sorts in the 1840s and 50s in New York with the Knickerbockers. But really, baseball as we know it, the major leagues, right, aren't formed until the 1880s. And the 1870s and 80s is when Major League Baseball really becomes a thing, the national pastime. That term is coined in this period because this grows so fast right after the Civil War. Don't forget, baseball is seen as something of a salve, something of a, a bomb that helps bind this country back together. The, you know, something like the national pastime, a sport that was played by everyone but all over the country, had never existed. And baseball is seen as this wonderful salve that is, you know, it's, it's growing fastest in the South. And so it is seen as something that's helping bind the country back together. And as it begins to grow in its infancy, baseball actually looks a little bit more like America, right? Because baseball alone among all major institutions in America at that time in the late 1800s is integrated, not by a lot. Never more than one or two at the most black players on an otherwise all-white team. But how many black Supreme Court justices do you think there were in the 1880s? Right. So baseball is different. And we must give baseball its due. Now, baseball will eventually trade. What made it so wonderfully, uniquely different and ahead of its time will trade that for what has become baseball's original sin. But that's still a few years away. So people like Bud Fowler, one of the most impassioned, exciting early black ball players, who we're gonna hear more about, a man who lived to play baseball, Frank Grant, I throw him in because Frank Grant was the first black professional baseball player from Massachusetts, from the Berkshires. And most famous of all, the Walker brothers. Moses Fleetwood Walker right here, his younger brother Weldy Walker right here. They were teammates briefly in 1881 on the Oberlin Ohio College baseball team. And Moses Fleetwood Walker was a transformational figure. Really, in, in, in more ways than one. Obviously, he was transformational as a baseball figure. Moses Fleetwood Walker, so I said that this is the period of time when the term national pastime is coined. It's also the period of time when the term backstop is coined. Now, I think I speak for everybody in this room, if we think of the term backstop today, we think of a physical structure, right? The backstop on a baseball field where, you know, you, there'll be some netting and so forth and it comes around by home plate and it keeps a batted ball from flying out and hitting somebody in the face, right? That didn't even exist when baseball begins to grow in terms of a physical structure. In fact, very often there weren't physical structures of any kind, including seats, because baseball is being played, for instance, in the American South during this period on fields that have actually freshly been cleared of rubble 
from Sherman's March to the Sea in many places. Seriously. So there's no backstop. It's a person. Backstop is coined originally to be that's where you stuck what they called the backstop, who was also called the catcher. And it was where you would stick the least talented player on the whole team. So today, the, the position of catcher is considered the most skilled position in baseball. Then, it was the least skilled. In fact, they had one job and one job only. There was no calling pitches. There was no throwing anybody out. Moses Fleetwood Walker will become the first person to throw out a base runner attempting to steal a base. It had always been legal. There's just never been anybody good enough to do it, which has made me always wonder what the reaction of that runner must have been. Who was throwing? He said, what do you mean I'm out? Right? So he was what we would call today in baseball a five-tool player. Ever hear that term? It means he played all five facets of the game, and he played them with great skill. He could hit, he could run, he could hit with power, he could field his position, and he could throw. So it was absolutely irresistible for a major league team to sign this wonder of a catcher, right? And believe me, you can understand at this period of time, white major league teams were not recruiting and signing black ball players. That's how good he was, because they knew what would come with it. And of course, it did, just like it would later for Jackie Robinson. So in 1884, the Toledo Blue Stockings in Toledo, Ohio, are a major league baseball team. And they sign Moses Fleetwood Walker to be the starting catcher for the 1884 season. And he was transformational for that alone. This is a young black man who's born when slavery still existed. Look at the date, 1884. That's less than 20 years, less than two decades, just under two decades from the end of the Civil War, from the Emancipation Proclamation, from Abraham Lincoln's assassination, and you have a young black man who was born when slavery still existed, whose parents were born into slavery, and he is now about to become the first black major league ball player. This is huge. This is the feel-good story of 1884, and it was reported that way. Now, which is not to say everybody thought it was a feel-good story. Unfortunately, one of those who did not think it was a feel-good story at all, who didn't like it at all, happened to be somebody who had an outsized influence in Major League Baseball, Cap Anson. Cap Anson, well, to give the man his due, uh, Cap Anson was really the first bona fide superstar of early Major League Baseball. He was a slugging first baseman, captain of the Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs were the marquee baseball team of early baseball. This was the team that people traveled all night on trains to go see play in hopes that their dashing, slugging first baseman captain would hit a home run. Cap Anson still to this day holds two or three batting records for the Chicago Cubs, which is extraordinary because this was what they call, you know, the dead ball era. The ball was kind of mushy. It just didn't go as far. It wasn't like today where you have a little cork center and a little red rubber super ball in the middle. Not like that, right? So all of that is part of Cap Anson's record. All of that is on his plaque in Cooperstown. You know, it's not on his plaque. Cap Anson was all, also a vicious, unrepentant racist. He was a bully. And apparently he had an uncommonly foul mouth none of which is on that plaque. However, he didn't like the idea that the Cubs were opening up the 1884 season against the team that fielded a black ball player. Now, I use air quotes because Cap Anson never used that word. He used a word that, of course, we wouldn't say. So he didn't like the fact that the Cubs were opening up the season against the team that fielded a black ball player, and he played the game under protest. And following the game, he filed an official grievance with the owners of Major League Baseball, and he told them that going forward, the Cubs wouldn't take the field against any team that fielded a black ball player. Well, you can imagine that the owners of Major League Baseball at the time had to take a threat like this pretty seriously. I mean, this is, this is, the, this is the marquee player on the marquee team in all of baseball. This is the team, this is the player who's putting fannies in the seats. So that kind of threat is taken very seriously. But Major League Baseball executives, being the executives they were, they promptly tried to duck the controversy and not do anything about it, which worked for almost two years. But by 1887, Fowler gave a date specific that the Cubs would no longer play. And so now the owners of Major League Baseball had to act, and they did. And they met in Buffalo, New York in July 1887, and they voted to bar blacks from playing Major League Baseball. 
This is the color barrier. Uh, it was a stunning vote that the owners, I think, knew would attract a lot of attention, a lot of controversy, which is exactly why none of them ever faced a single question from a single reporter. There was absolutely no transparency, no record of the meeting, no transcript of the meeting, no transcript of who voted how. Either way, it was announced that a majority of major league owners had voted to bar black ball players from a major or minor league contract. Those who were playing under existing contracts like Walker would be allowed to play them out and there would be no more. The color barrier was now a reality. You know, I mentioned that Bud Fowler was one of the most impassioned young black ball players of that period, and he was. But what really kind of, well, you can imagine in a story like this, at a time like that, there's many stories that are, are, are poignant, um, upsetting. Uh, Bud Fowler's is one of two stories that I found heartbreaking. Um, because Bud Fowler was a very unusual person and player. Um, he was someone who lived to play baseball. People were awed by it. You know, they're like, you know, you should get out more. Because it's all he wanted to do. That, that defined his life. When I say Bud Fowler played baseball every day of the year, I mean exactly that. He, I mean exactly that. He would begin playing, obviously he'd be playing all summer up in North America. As the weather began to cool in North America, he'd begin making his way down south by fall and late fall up here. He'd be playing down in Florida and then Cuba, the Caribbean, and by full on winter up here, like right now, he'd be playing in South America. And then he'd work his way back up into North America. So he lived to play baseball and now he was no longer going to be able to do the single thing that seemed to give his life purpose and dignity and meaning. He died of a blood disorder in Frankfurt, New York in 1913. He was only 55. His unmarked grave told not a word of a truly extraordinary life. For years, since the color barrier began to spread in 1887, Fowler had relentlessly fought for place in organized baseball, along with all the other early black professional players. He had continued to try and play in the shadow of the descending barrier as teams shed black ball players and refused to sign more. Fowler had uncommon talent. There's no question about it. He's in the Hall of Fame. In fact, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. It'll be two years ago this summer. So he was inducted into the Hall of Fame with the class that included Big Poppy, yeah. David Ortiz. So there's no question about his talent, but very often people who observed him seem to feel that his greatest talent was just seeming to outrun what everybody knew would be the inescapable end. For Bud Fowler, the end came in Lansing, Michigan in 1895. He was finally and completely out of options. They all were, but the thing to know about Bud Fowler, he is literally the last black ball player standing. My skin is against me, Fowler wrote in 1895. If I hadn't been born quite so black, maybe I could have caught on as a Spaniard or something of that kind. The race prejudice is so strong, my black skin just bars me. Now, as the 20th century began to unfold, it barred them all. The color barrier was complete. It would take another 50 years of fierce Fowler-like will and determination to break through again. So now we're into the 1890s, right? Color barrier happens in 1887. Now we're into the 1890s. And remember, I said baseball had been an outlier, right? Baseball had been integrated. Not anymore. This is a period now where I, I say it's, a, it's like Jim Crow moves in on steroids. This is the period of what's been called the worst Supreme Court decision in the country's history. This is Plessy versus Ferguson, which starts out as a transportation issue in, in Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, uh, which seeks to bar blacks from riding on trains unless there's a dedicated car for, as the law put it, colored passengers. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court fines for the southern states. This is the separate but equal, and now it doesn't matter whether you are trying to play baseball, whether you are looking for a job, whether it's about going to school somewhere or where you live or whether what side of the room you line up on to get a drink at a public water fountain, segregation is now not only complete and everywhere, it is now segregation by sanction of the state itself. So we are now past that period and into 1900 and the 20th century. And I think another misconception that I, I think often goes along with thinking that Jackie Robinson integrated baseball when he, when, he, when he reintegrated is that I think there's often a perception I have found that 
people think that until Jackie Robinson, that blacks were not playing professional baseball. The only thing they weren't playing was major league baseball. They were playing a high level of professional baseball. This is the period 1900 to about 1920. This is the period that is often referred to as the barnstorming period, right? These were these, were these barnstorming teams that literally barnstormed. They, they would ride a rickety old bus around like all week long. They might cover six, seven, eight hundred miles in different regions of the country and they might play five, six, seven, eight, a dozen games in the space of, of five or six days when major league teams would play at most four or five to these days. So they were traveling all over the place. There were about a dozen truly extraordinary black barn storming teams. And by the way, these were teams that often played major league teams. Not on the major league schedule, obviously, but major league players at that time obviously weren't making the gazillion dollars they're making today. So major league players at that time, actually the major league players all through, I would say up to about the 19, mid 1960s, many, if not most major league players would still work a job over the winter time to make ends meet. And if they had an off day in the summertime, if say a major league team pulled into Cleveland or Detroit and didn't have a game with the, the Tigers or the Indians till the next day or two days, they'd pick up exhibition games and make some money. And these black barnstorming teams were the perfect team to pick up an exhibition game with because they were always available and they represented a high level of competition. How high? They frequently beat major league teams. My favorite example of this is in 1903. I think I have the year right. I know this guy was pitching. Um, Chicago Black Giants picked up a three-game weekend series against the Cincinnati Redlegs, as the Reds were then called, and the Reds lost all three games. Uh, Rube Foster, who is the first great black pitcher, Rube Foster pitched two of the three games in a weekend. Both complete games. One of them went 12 innings. You will never, if he lives to be 1,010, see Chris Sale do that, okay? Uh, okay, so Rube Foster, Rube Foster was, oh, by the way, on Monday morning, after, after the Redlegs lost all three games to the Chicago Black Giants, the owner of the Cincinnati Redlegs sends out a letter to the manager forbidding him from playing any more black barnstorming teams. I don't care who they are, he said. You're not playing them, right? It was very embarrassing. Right? Rube Foster embarrassed a lot of hitters because um, he, was in, he was a terrifying presence on the mound. I mean, lovely guy, but he was a, a big Texas kid. He stood about 6'4", weighed about 235, anywhere, as they would say, on any given day, between 235 and 250. It was like a left tackle on the mound, right? Blazing fastball. Players would routinely come up with phantom injuries, right? Like those Reds in that weekend. More, more than one of them would say, Skip, I, whoa, my hip is acting up, because they didn't know... It was terrifying to stand in against this guy. Now, part of the terror apparently had to do with the fact that frequently he didn't know where the hell the ball was going. So that didn't help. But he is important to our history, and especially to breaking the color barrier, not because of how great a pitcher he was. And he was. But that's not why he's known today. Um, Rube Foster is known as the father of black baseball. And Rube Foster understood something in an almost eerily prophetic way. He understood that while he was playing, two things. One, he understood he would never live long enough to make it to the major leagues. He was finished playing by 1917, and he understood he's never going to get back to the major leagues. He never was in it, but he's not going to be able to. The, the color barrier is not going to fall, he realized, in his lifetime in his lifetime. Um, but he also understood something else. He understood that the system that the black ball players had going, this, this, this barnstorming crazy system, players playing all over the place, he understood that was never going to be the vehicle that would get them back to the major leagues because he understood as good as he was, this guy is one of the greatest pitchers who've ever lived. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of people like Walter Johnson and Christy Mathewson and Lefty Grove who saw this guy pitch, three of the greatest pitchers who've ever lived, and they saw him pitch and told him. In fact, you talk about a backhanded compliment. I have to quote one of them, Christy Mathewson, who told him after the game, I'm quoting, what a goddamn shame you were born a Negro, is what the quote was, right? Because, as he said, if you were white, you could play on any major league team you want. 
And it was true. It was absolutely true. But he couldn't because he was black. And he understood that this barnstorming thing is never going to allow black players to get back to the major leagues because everybody knew Christy Mathewson wherever they played. And if they played, if the Chicago Black Giants played like in that series against great Reds players, if they played against Mathewson, Walter Johnson, they white fans came out because they wanted to see the great big train Walter Johnson pitch. They didn't know who the hell this guy was. Now, they might say after the game, whoa, that guy's good, but they didn't know who the hell he was. That's what Rube Foster understood. They would know who I was if I also was based in Washington and could play the Senators every now and then. Then they would know who I am. So he said, enough with this barnstorming system. We have to have a league of our own. We have to have an organized league where teams are in cities across the country and fans know, and by fans, he meant white fans, because black fans knew who these players were. Black fans came out to these games, but black fans hadn't barred black players from Major League Baseball. Whites had. So he understood we have to create a league, an elite showcase that white America will recognize as the highest level of black baseball, just like they recognize the major leagues as the highest level of white baseball. And he, unlike anyone before him, was able to pull it off. Rube Foster is the father of the single most significant, vital, unsung hero in the entire effort to break down the color barrier. He created the Negro Leagues. Rube Foster, father of black baseball, creator of the Negro Leagues. There's Rube Foster on the day the Negro Leagues were created. This is the founding class of the Negro Leagues. In Kansas City, Missouri, that's Foster. I want to draw your attention, though, to this guy because he's going to come up right to the end of our story, believe it or not, in a way that Rube Foster won't. This guy right here. J.L. Wilkinson. J.L. Wilkinson is the owner at that time. He is, first of all, he's the only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. Born in 1920, they begin to go away, obviously, with the color barrier falling in, in 1947. Through the 50s and 60s, they're petering up. By, the 19, by 1970, they're gone. He's the only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. Now, I'm not, I'm not pointing that out to create some sort of racial peculiarity. I'm pointing that out because obviously we're talking about the color barrier. And spoiler alert, the color barrier is going to fall in the process of our sitting here tonight talking about this. And Jackie Robinson's going to make a triumphant appearance. Okay, This guy plays a role in that. Because there's a direct line between him sitting here on this day in 1920, 25 years out to 1945, because J.L. Wilkinson will be the Negro League owner who signs Jackie Robinson to his first professional baseball contract. And then it will just be six months until the color barrier falls. So the Negro Leagues are born and the Negro Leagues take off. Think of it this way. Think of it like there had been this, this, this fire hose of talent, black baseball talent in America that was crimped because there were only about a dozen or so great barnstorming teams like the Chicago Black Giants. It, right? So they, it was tough for the, 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 the pool of talent to hook on with one of those teams. With the creation of the Negro Leagues now, there's many more teams now for these players to hook up with. right? So now the talent kind of gushes forth. People like John Pops Lloyd, first great black home run hitter. Judy Johnson, one of the most colorful black players in history. A decade or so later, Oscar Charleston, one of the greatest fielding shortstops in baseball history. And my personal favorite, partly because I think he has the best nickname in baseball history, Cool Papa Bell. You can't even say that name without sounding cool. Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell. Arguably, actually not arguably, all baseball historians recognize him today as the fastest human being to have ever played baseball. So the Negro Leagues take off. And true to Rube Foster's prophecy, they are now based in every major league city that has a major league team, now also has a Negro League team. Didn't happen in Boston, but it happens all over the country, right? They go from a founding class of 14 teams to 18 teams to 32 teams. They're able to celebrate it, separate into a Negro American League, a Negro National League. They're able to have the first of two Negro League World Series, and it looks like the sky will be the limit for the growth of the Negro Leagues. And it might have been, it might have been, if the sky instead hadn't fallen in. Because, of course, the first decade of the Negro League's growth in the 1920s ends in 1929 with what? The Great Depression. You know, 
I think we sometimes forget just how cataclysmic the Great Depression was. Again, it's talking about how we remember and how we comprehend history. Now, look, I don't think there's any, obviously there's nobody in this room who doesn't fully get that the Great Depression was a, a, a catastrophe, the likes of which we haven't thankfully seen again. I mean, 25% unemployment, quarter of all Americans out of work, out of work during the first worst years of the Great Depression. We've had unemployment in the last decade a couple of times now. We've had unemployment functionally under 1%. It's just barely 3% now, 25%. And in minority communities, incredibly flip that. In minority communities from Denver to Detroit to Pittsburgh, 70%, like in Atlanta, 70% unemployment. Only a quarter working in many minority communities. More than 30,000 businesses going under every year during the first worst years of the Great Depression, including the Negro Leagues, gone. With one exception, as we'll see, gone. Now, you might wonder how many major league teams went out of business during the Great Depression, right? Because obviously, all of the then 16 major league teams were in and of themselves thriving American businesses, 30,000 of which were going under. Anybody take a guess? How many went under? Zero. You're right. You're right, because the major leagues were insulated because of their wealth. And the reason I, I point out Tom Yawkey here, former, the late Tom Yawkey, owner of the Boston Red Sox, um, the reason I point that out is to give you just a sense of how much wealth insulated the major league teams from the Great Depression in a way that the Negro Leagues could not possibly be insulated. So I don't know if you remember what you got on your 16th birthday, but Tom Yawkey came into $16.34 million. Uh, wait, five years later, he came into the rest of his trust and another $16.34 million. Now we're talking real money, and he bought the Boston Red Sox. So that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That was a lot of money then, not just now. Meet the pauper of Major League Baseball owners at that time. You take all 16 Major League Baseball owners in 1930, Tom Yawkey is number 16 in terms of wealth. That's what insulated Major Leagues from going under during the Great Depression. We talked about the Cubs. Cubs were owned by a guy named Phil Wrigley. I guarantee everybody in this room has used Mr. Wrigley's product, right? At one time or another, I always feel under a desk or something, see if I can feel his product. I'm nine times out of 10, I can. <laughs> Sometimes it's mine. Um, we Cubs were owned by Wrigley, right? And, and St. Louis, Cardinals were owned by Gussie Bush, who was brewing a little beer out there, out on the East Coast. The Yankees, you know what beer Jacob Rupert was brewing? Knickerbocker, exactly. So these guys were fabulously more wealthy even than Tom Yawkey. So they were insulated, Negro Leagues were not. I mentioned there was one exception to the Negro Leagues going under, and we're back to our friend, J.L. Wilkinson of the Kansas City Monarchs, because when the Depression hit, he's a remarkable guy. You want to have some fun sometimes. Google J.L. Wilkinson of the Kansas City Monarchs. Very progressive guy, very ahead of his time. Signed a woman to a baseball contract in the 1930s, right? Baseball, not softball. Very progressive guy. And when the Depression hit, he really did not want to lay off his team. And he told them, I'll tell you what, fellas, I'll buy a bus. And if, you'll, if you're willing to play baseball, like every day, I'll line up games and we'll just keep playing baseball. And they did. Here they are barnstorming through Canada in the in 1930s, right? In the early years of the Great Depression. Now, they could never have kept doing that indefinitely. And fortunately for our story, they didn't have to. Because in the first worst years of the Great Depression, the single most improbable event in the entire story takes place. The Negro Leagues are reborn. Think about how improbable this is. First of all, nothing's being reborn during the Great Depression. Things are dying left, right, and center. They're reborn. Look where they're reborn. Pittsburgh, ground zero for unemployment during the American Depression. Ground zero, highest unemployment in the country. This is where the Negro Leagues are reborn. And look who brings them back. Two guys who hated each other's guts. Lifelong enemies, these two guys. Um, the only thing, as far as we know, the only time they ever sat in the same room and breathed the same air was a meeting to bring back the Negro Leagues. So for that, we should be grateful. Cumberland Posey Jr. was an interesting figure in his own right. His dad was a pioneering black figure in Pittsburgh. His dad had been the first licensed uh, black civil engineer. 
and started two or three, uh, very good businessman, started two or three thriving businesses, did very well, built a big home for his family in the Hill District, the uh, black section of Pittsburgh. I, I am sure that he hoped his young son, Composy Jr., would follow him into business, but his son was a sports fanatic. Basketball, which was a relatively new sport then, and baseball. Baseball, fortunately for this story, wins out. He's approached in the late 1920s, come Posey Jr. He's approached about saving a celebrated Pittsburgh ball club, black ball club, called the Homestead Grays, right? So Homestead section of Pittsburgh. He's approached about saving this team, which is up for sale, and if nobody buys them, they're gone, right? So he wants to save the team. So he puts all his savings in. He raises some money. His dad loans him some money. He gets a couple of slender lines of credit from a black-owned bank, and he buys the Homestead Grays. Now, what happens next is historic. It's never been repeated. Um, you know, and partly I think it has to do with the fact that of all his gifts and skills, and he had many, he had many, um, he was a great, had already been a great baseball coach, player, um, now he was the manager, the owner, the general manager, but the skill that was about to make this happen is something that nobody could have foreseen because he had never been in this position really before. And that is, he appeared to have an incredible skill of motivating, inspiring young athletes. How well did he aspire? Look, I could tell you stories and anecdotes, but it's easier to just look at the results, okay? So 1931, First year, the Composy Jr. is the owner and manager of the Homestead Grays. And the Homestead Grays went out and had the greatest single season of any baseball team in the history of baseball. It never happened before. It will never happen again. Um, so at this time, let me, let me put it in 143 wins in context, both for that time and for today. So for that time, at that time, Major League Baseball didn't play 162 games. They played 154. They came within less than 10 games of going undefeated, right? So they are, uh, you know, a team that is built to win every single game, it would seem. But to put it in context of... The present day, there are two major league teams today. One of them plays just about an hour north of here. Um, two major league teams today that now it's two years ago. Two years ago, so Major League Baseball, that team and the other team I'm thinking of both played 162 games, right? So between them, their wins did not total 143. They won 143 games. Now, you can imagine that his arch enemy, Gus Greenlee, wanted to outdo him, competitive as they were, and he almost did. Completely different story, Gus Greenlee, very hard scrabble life growing up in Pittsburgh, one of six brothers, constantly getting thrown out of school, uh, enlists in the army in World War I, he goes off to fight, and he's wounded at the Battle of Verdun in France, he's decorated, comes back to Pittsburgh, now it's both Prohibition and the Great Depression, you can't even get a drink to drown your sorrows, he needs a job, he puts some money together, he buys a rickety old car, he's gonna drive a cab. Okay, fine. Guy comes up to him after he's driving his cab for a little bit. He says, hey, pal, is this your car? He says, yeah, what about it? He says, no, no, listen. Uh, I represent the Latrobe Brewing Company. Ever, anybody ever have a Rolling Rock beer? Okay. They were brewing beer right through the Great Depression, illegally, but so is everybody. So they were looking for somebody to run their bootleg liquor around to all the little speakeasies. And he says, sure, I'll do it. So he's doing it. Now he's making some extra money. A couple of weeks later, another guy comes up to him. He says, hey, pal, is this your car? He said, what do you got? He said, geez, all of a sudden, everybody's interested in my car. He says, no, no. He said, listen, listen, listen. He said, I represent all the major bookies in Pittsburgh, and we're looking for somebody to move our bets around the city in a very uh, kind of undistinguished car like yours. <laughs> so, so he said, fine, I'll do it. So now he's making money hand over fist, and he realizes if he cuts out the middlemen, he'll make even more money because he doesn't have to give them a cut. So he does. I don't, I don't mean he, like, <clears throat> cut them out. But he did go off and start doing this all by himself. And now, let me tell you how much money Gus Greenlee is making in the worst years of the Great Depression. At one point, Gus Greenlee was making 12,500 bucks a week. So he builds a ballpark, 
Seriously, he builds a ballpark. He doesn't have a baseball team, but he builds a ballpark. Now he built, then he builds a jazz club. He doesn't have like jazz players for his jazz club, but he built a jazz club. Now, I don't know how much Gus Greenlee liked jazz. I don't know how much he liked baseball. You know what he really liked? He loved that these were ways to launder all that dirty money, right? So then he gets to actually buy a baseball team. Because just like his rival, he's approached about saving another black ball club in Pittsburgh. And the Pittsburgh Crawfords are reborn under Gus Greenlee. And a year after his arch enemy wins 143 games, the Pittsburgh Crawfords win almost 100 games. And he did it by doing the same thing he did in business. He stole it. Uh, when I say stole, oh, there's his jazz club. When I say stole, it wasn't so much that he stole it, he poached the best players from his arch enemy's team, from the Homestead Grays. And that's only half true. Oh, they were the best players on the Homestead Grays, make no mistake about it, but it doesn't give you a full enough sense of how good they were. They were two of the best players who've ever played the sport of baseball. One of them was a promising young pitcher by the name of Satchel Page. The other was a very promising slugging young catcher by the name of Josh Gibson. There is no way to overstate the importance of these two players in breaking the color barrier. Because Satchel Page and Josh Gibson, what they did was they would become the two players that white America would look at and say, wow, if those two players can't play Major League Baseball, something's wrong with this picture. Because they would be not on any white Major League team, they would be a superstar on any Major League team that they played on, but they couldn't. So that's how much they changed it. There's nothing unsung about Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson. They're two of the most sung heroes in American sports history. Satchel Paige, bigger than life, one of the most quoted Americans to this day. Both of them are in the Hall of Fame. Josh Gibson, very quiet, very shy, kind of a tragic life in some ways, but an incredible slugging hitter. May have hit the longest home run, ever hit at Yankee Stadium, uh, both of them in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Josh Gibson was known even in his playing days as the Black Babe Ruth. So that tells you something, right? My favorite story. Late in his playing career, Josh Gibson meets the real life Babe Ruth. And apparently they were at some function, and apparently Babe Ruth, I guess he had a thing about, like he put his arm around him and then he would like shake you a little bit. And uh, so he did that and he said, Mr. Gibson, he said, what a goddamn honor this is. Hey, he said, I understand they call you the Black Babe Ruth. How about that? Josh Gibson looks at Babe Ruth and he says, well, I gotta be honest with you, Mr. Ruth, my people call you the white Josh Gibson. <laughs> so, I mean, what do you think of that? So, 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 we've been talking all about the Negro Leagues, which is as it should be, because they're the most important part of the story. But the question is, how do we know so much about the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues didn't keep track of their own records, ever, ever. The Negro Leagues were hand-to-mouth operations, right? It was all they could do to come up with the money for every game, whether or not they had a bus, whether or not they had gas for the bus, whether they had bats, balls, cleats, gloves, uniforms. They didn't, they didn't have money to hire a statistician to keep track of their, their records like Major League Baseball. You can look up the first Major League Baseball play ever played and see who did what in the bottom of the third inning. You couldn't remotely do that with the Negro Leagues. You might say, well, what about newspapers? What about the press? The press didn't follow the Negro Leagues. In the entire history of the Negro Leagues, there was never a single beat reporter who was assigned to cover not a single Negro League team or the Negro Leagues as a whole. Never. So if the Negro Leagues weren't keeping track of their own records and the white mainstream press wasn't keeping track of the Negro Leagues, who was keeping track of the Negro Leagues? The second only to the Negro Leagues themselves, the second most vital unsung hero in the entire saga of breaking the color barrier of the black press. Because while the Negro Leagues were presenting a showcase for the greatest black ball players who were playing at that time, it was the black press that was introducing, look, everybody wasn't going to Negro League games. It was the black press that was introducing people to who these players were. It was the black press that was introducing America to Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson. 
pioneering publishers like Robert Lee Van of the Pittsburgh Courier, greatest distribution of any black newspaper in American history, just slightly more so than Robert Sengstack Abbott's equally legendary Chicago Defender. And they hired pioneering sports writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, who covered these games covered games like in 1939 when uh, Wendell Smith was reporting on a game at Yankee Stadium. Black, Black Yankees, Satchel Paige pitching, played the New York Yankees. Satchel Paige struck out the great Joe DiMaggio three times. Only time in DiMaggio's, look it up, only time in DiMaggio's entire career he struck out three games. Never did it in a major league game. This was an exhibition game. And Robert Lee Van, his boss, told Wendell Smith that night, called him up and he said, you make sure, he said, I don't give a damn what you write about the game. I don't give a damn how you want to present the box score. You make sure, you make sure that you put in your story because he said, I guarantee you, New York City is going to be a buzz tomorrow morning where people are going to want to know, how can we get Satchel Page? You tell them, Satchel Page can be in uniform, signed, lock, stock, and barrel for the Yankees by noon tomorrow, but he can't because of the color barrier, and you remind them, and he did. And that story was picked up all over the country. Wendell Smith's piece about the game, people knew that Satchel Page, who's Satchel Page? He struck out DiMaggio three times. People were reading that story, I guarantee, down here in Hanson, they were reading that story all over the South Shore. They were reading it in Boston, they were reading it in Bangor, they were reading it in Miami, Biloxi, Phoenix, Fort Worth, San Francisco, LA, Spokane, you get the idea. How is that possible? In a black newspaper they were reading. How is that possible? How is that possible? These papers, these black newspapers, just like the Negro League games, the teams that they covered, were hand-to-mouth operations. It was all they could do to get the paper distributed just out within the black community five nights a week. How the hell are they getting their paper distributed nationally? Boston Globe didn't have national distribution in the 1930s. How were they doing it? The most fascinating, the most unlikely unsung hero in the entire story, the Pullman Porters. You know, I knew a little bit about most of these people. I did, look, I don't mean to miss, like I didn't, there are plenty of things I didn't know and I learned in researching, but I knew a little bit. I knew who Walker was and that sort of thing. I had no idea the role that the Pullman Porters played in breaking the color barrier. What would the Pullman Porters have to do with breaking the color barrier? The Pullman Porters were the face of overnight train travel in the Golden Age of Rail. Pullman porters were servants on wheels. That's not my description. Goodness. That's the mission statement of George Mortimer Pullman, who founded and created the Pullman porters. They would meet you at the platform. They would show you to your seats, take your bags. Later, they might show you to the dining car. Later, they might show you to your berth, where they've turned down your berth. They would keep track of who needed a wake-up call. Of course, then it was a wake-up knock. That was the Pullman porters. What the hell did they have to do with baseball? Ah, so those pioneering newspaper publishers were very, very creative guys. And they understood. They looked at the Pullman Porters and they said, whoa, wait a minute. We have people from the black community who are riding the rails, traveling to every part of America every day. What if we could recruit some of them to distribute our newspaper? And they did. They didn't need every Pullman porter. Any Pullman porter that agreed to do this and was ever caught doing it would have been fired, and not a single one ever was. You wonder how did it work? So let's say that a train was leaving South Station, Boston. It's going to make a run right down the eastern seaboard, right? Boston, New York, Baltimore, Philly, Chattanooga, Miami, all the way down, right? So the Pullman porters also worked the kitchen. They provisioned the train. So they would have had a deal with like a, a black bakery in Boston. Right? that would come to deliver the bread to the train before they took off. Right? So the little bread truck would roll out. At that time, you could roll right out on the platform. would have a little platform in the back of the truck, you know, maybe four or five, five-foot-tall wicker baskets filled with bread. Underneath the bread, the black newspapers of Boston. They would take off. They'd stop in New York. They'd offload the black newspapers from Boston. They'd unload the black newspapers from New York. They would do the same thing in every city they stopped in completely under the radar, <clears throat> and they're doing this all around the country, so that by 1939, you have this New York Times executive who's vacationing in LA, and his wife calls him that night. She says, you are not gonna believe what happened in Yankee Stadium today. Have you heard? He said, no. 
She said, this guy Satchel Paige struck out Joe DiMaggio three times. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, get the paper in the morning. It should come in overnight. So he does. He wakes up. He lights up probably, a, you know, an unfiltered lucky. Puts on his fedora. He's walking down Holly Bull- Hollywood Boulevard. He stops at a newsstand. He's looking for the New York Times. He can't find it. He sees the Pittsburgh Courier. Checks the date. Yesterday. He's like, what the hell is this doing here? He goes to the next newsstand. The Times hasn't come in. Some glitch. Another Pittsburgh Courier. And the Chicago Defender. He calls up New York. He says, what the hell is going on? Well, the Pullman Porters is what was going on. So now we're up to 1940. And a big spoiler alert now. So we are now less than 10 minutes and only five years from the color barrier coming down. And Jackie Robinson will make a final triumphant appearance. How's that going to happen? In 1940, Major League Baseball was no closer to getting rid of the color barrier than it had been in 1930 or 1920 or 1900, for that matter. Mostly because of this guy. Kennesaw Mountain Lantis in 1940 is the commissioner of Major League Baseball. Kennesaw Mountain Landis was the very first baseball commissioner appointed in 1920. Talk about some job security, right? And he won't even listen to taking a meeting about the color barrier. Won't even talk about it. Very mule-headed, stubborn, ornery is a word that is often used to describe Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And that was, that, that was how his wife described him. So, so that's not happening. So what happens? Well, the 1930s ends just like the decade previous with another worldwide cataclysm, right? Which is, of course, the advent of World War II. And in New York, where now the action shifts to New York, this guy comes up with the argument that will bring the color barrier down. Lester Rodney is nobody's picture of an ally in the struggle to bring the color barrier down. Not that he liked the color barrier, hated it, loved baseball, hated the color barrier, just didn't look the part. Didn't look, first of all, he's white. He's in New York, he's Jewish, he's a communist. Hey, nobody's perfect, okay? Let's get that straight, okay? But he needed a job writing. He was a young sports writer. He would have written for anybody. But in the late 1930s, the American Communist Party's daily worker newspaper started a sports section. He got the job. So he's writing for them, and he starts adding something by the late 1930s. He starts adding a little note to his readers. So he might cover a ball game, he might have an interview with Leo DeRocher, you know, and the Giants and his, but he would add something. He believed that America was going to war, even by 1939. 1939, World War II has already begun in Europe, but many in America, including some famous people like, uh, oh, I don't know, Mr. Lindbergh, uh, didn't want to go to war, didn't want to go to war, didn't want America to get involved. He was convinced that we will have to go to war to help defend democracy worldwide. And he began telling his readers that, mark my words, America is going to war. Blacks as well as whites will be training to defend democracy. Blacks as well as whites will train and be asked to die if necessary to defend democracy. He said the difference is those who are black and have just been asked to die if necessary for their country will return to a country where they're still second-class citizens, where they can't sit where they want on a bus, and they can't play Major League Baseball. If you've ever wondered, that's what's going to bring the color barrier down. Listen, the color barrier existed in the First World War, too, and it was just as obscene then. But now it just becomes something that the average American cannot countenance any longer. In the wake of watching black men and women go off to fight and die, that they should be able to play baseball at the major leagues. So that's the argument that's gonna bring it down. And it begins to grow, it begins to grow. Those newspaper publishers start the double V campaign, double victory, because that was an agonizing decision. Do I fight and come back and can't sit where I want on the bus or play baseball? So the double victory campaign was meant to say yes. Yes, fight. Defeat Adolf Hitler, Victory won, come home, defeat Jim Crow, victory two. That handkerchief was given out in the newspapers of the Pittsburgh Courier. It was worn in the bomber jacket sleeves of all members of the Tuskegee Airmen, the most famous all-black unit in World War II. But it is another all-black unit that I bet you never heard of that's going to take us to the end of the story now from the turret of a tank. The 761st original fighting Black Panthers 
The 761st was the first all-black armored unit in World War II. They fought for, as part of Patton's army, and they set records for consecutive days at the front. One of the first units to liberate a death camp, one of the first units to liberate a death camp, they would go on to create all kinds of, of legends around them. But what makes them part of this story is that the 761st were led by a young lieutenant by the name of Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Jackie Robinson got his lieutenant stripes at Fort Kearney in Kansas in 1940. In 1941, he was transferred to Fort Hood in Texas to help take command of the 761st, and he couldn't wait to take command of the 761st and lead them into combat against the Nazis. Didn't get there. Didn't get there. The 761st did, without their young lieutenant. Just before the 761st shipped out, Jackie Robinson flunked his final physical. An old knee injury reared its head. He'd been an All-American halfback at UCLA. Not cleared for combat. Desperately asked for special permission to accompany the unit as a morale officer. Request denied. He was crushed, said it was the biggest disappointment of his life. 761st ships out. Jackie Robinson checks out of the hospital, decides he's gonna go back to the base, get a drink at the Black Officers Club. Fort Hood, enormous base. Buses constantly circling the base. He jumps on a bus, takes a seat, right behind the driver, front row. Maybe you see where this is going. So at that time, as it was the case all over America, blacks were expected to move to the back of the bus if a bus began to fill up with white passengers who wanted a seat. Now, the bus driver claimed later in testimony he didn't know what Jackie Robinson knew and was acting on, but Jackie Robinson knew something that the bus driver either didn't know or chose to ignore, probably didn't know. 48 hours earlier, President Roosevelt had signed an executive decree that prohibited discrimination and segregation on domestic transport within American military bases. Robinson knew he was allowed to sit wherever he wanted. Driver either didn't know, didn't care. Bus begins to fill up. Robinson's asked to move. He refuses. Bus driver pulls over to a sentry post. Two MPs get on the bus. They handcuff Jackie Robinson. He's arrested, court-martialed, insubordination. How many of you know that Jackie Robinson was once court-martialed? Mm. So, Go with my twisted logic here, because you'll see what I'm saying. If, if somebody in this room knew that Jackie Robinson had been court-martialed, and they said, did you know Jackie Robinson was once court-martialed? The rest of us would say, who the hell is Jackie Robinson? Jackie Robinson would never have been able to be signed by Branch Rickey to break the color barrier if he had been dishonorably discharged by the US Army. But he beat the court-martial. He beat the court-martial, so now it's 1944, and Robinson resigns from the Army, honorably discharged. Now he needs a job. He's about to trade his Army uniform for a baseball uniform, because some people have told him in Texas, you should get in touch with J.L. Wilkinson. He owns the Kansas City Monarchs. They're in spring training in Houston, Texas, right now. So he does. He writes a letter to J.L. Wilkinson, and J.L. Wilkinson doesn't write back. He calls him. I would have loved to have been in on this phone conversation. <laughs> he, he's, you can read about it in Jackie Robinson's autobiography. So he calls Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson picks up the phone. He goes, hello, this is Jackie Robinson. And Wilkinson goes, I know who the hell you are. I called you. It went downhill from there. He says, I understand you want a tryout with my monarchs. He says, sir, I would love to have a tryout with your monarchs. Well, you can't have one. Robinson said it felt like the phone went dead for five minutes. I think it was a long pause. And then Wilkinson said, Mr. Robinson, would you like to know why you can't have a tryout? I would like to know, sir, because I'm giving you a job instead. Get yourself to Houston. We had almost done with spring training, and he hung up the phone. And Jackie Robinson immediately made his way to Houston, where he broke camp with the Monarchs, and then he was in Kansas City, in April 1945, ready to start the season with the Kansas City Monarchs. Now, nobody knew that Jackie Robinson had once been court-martialed. How many of you know that less than three weeks from the time this picture was taken, Jackie Robinson would be less than an hour from where we're sitting right now, on the field at Fenway Park, trying out for the Boston Red Sox? I knew it. 
You knew that. You know yeah. Out. Yeah. More people, especially in the Boston area, know that he tried out. Because at the same time he's breaking camp with the Monarchs, in Boston, this guy is trying to force the Red Sox to try out some of those returning black ball players who'd been serving in the war. Izzy Muchnick was a fascinating figure. I go into greater detail in the book, a bit of a tragic figure in some ways, but he was motivated always, whether it was trying to force the Red Sox to have a trial, or it was trying to force the Boston school system to give pay parity for women. He was always, the only word that comes to mind when, you, when, it, when I began to learn more about Izzy Muchnick is Don Quixote. Right? He was always like tilting at windmills, lost causes. This was one, although it was one of his few victories, because he did succeed in forcing the Red Sox to try out some black ball players. It was hard to find the way to do it. Uh, he, was a, he was a tough young lawyer. Harvard, Harvard Law School, could have worked for any of those, you know, what they used to call the white shoe Boston law firms, but he wouldn't change his name. So instead, he opened up his own practice, and he's trying to find a way to force the Red Sox, and then he finds it. Remember those old um, blue laws that used to exist, right? So there was a blue law that was still on the books in 1945 in Boston that prohibited professional baseball being played in Boston on a Sunday without the unanimous vote of the Boston City Council. Izzy Muchnick, I've always imagined him late that night pouring over the, and finding this blue law, taking off his glasses and just like rubbing his eyes and thinking, holy cow. I sit on the Boston City Council. All I have to do is threaten to withhold my vote. I got leverage. He used it. He sent a letter to the brain trust of the Boston Red Sox. There they are. There's Yaki, player manager Joe Cronin, general manager Eddie Collins, himself a former Hall of Famer. And he wrote this letter. He said, Mr. Collins, I'm asking to humbly request that the Red Sox, in light of many qualified Negro, as he wrote, Negro ball players returning from the war, looking for a spot in baseball, that the Red Sox would offer a tryout, not a job, just a tryout to some of these qualified players. Cordially yours, Boston City Councilor Izzy Muchnick. Well, Eddie Collins wrote back and he said, my esteemed Councilor Muchnick, you can probably see where this is going. He says, um, I certainly empathize with your sincere request, but he said it might, it, might, it, it, it might interest you to know that in my entire tenure with the Boston Red Sox, we have never had a single black ball player inquire about employment. It must be that there's no interest. Cordially yours, Eddie Collins. Well, Izzy Muchnick was a tough, tough, tough cookie. Played goal for Harvard, no mask. He knew when he was taking a load of incoming um, <clears throat> you-know-what. So he waited a little bit, and then he waited a little more. He waited till it was one week to the day of that vote for Sunday baseball in the Boston City Council. And then he sent a cablegram to Eddie Collins. And he said, Mr. Collins, this cable should serve to inform you that in light of your refusal to entertain a tryout, I will be withholding my vote for Sunday baseball when the vote is taken in the city council chamber Wednesday next. Now, I don't know, obviously, what the exact duration of time was between the time Eddie Collins read that cable and appeared in his boss, Tom Yawkey's office. I have a very strong sense it was well under five minutes and he was running. Um, that would have been a cataclysm financially for the Red Sox. 1945, pre-TV, 100% ticket revenue for every baseball team. And on Sunday in 1945, every major league team plays two games, doubleheader every Sunday. Red Sox would have been denied 50% of their Sunday revenue, unthinkable. So they send a cable back, they say, fine, you can have your tryout, three players, that's it, three. No press or the deal's off. Have the players at Gate D, Fenway Park, 11 a.m., Monday, April 12th. Now, on Monday, April 12th, well, as we'll see first, Izzy Muchnick knew a lot about Boston's bylaws, but he did not know a lot about black baseball. So he consulted with our friend Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier, and he asked him if he could hand select, hand select three great black ball players to try out for the Boston Red Sox. So he did, and one of them was a promising young infielder out of Kansas City named Jackie Robinson. So they came to Boston ready to try out, but on April 12th, history intervened. On April 12, 1945, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt died, and America shut down. 24 hours later, America began to open back up. 48 hours later, America was pretty much back to normal, except at the offices of the Boston Red Sox, where they appeared to be in the throes of inconsolable grief or something. 
No, they were trying to run out the clock. And they almost made all they had to do two more days. All they had to do was get to April 16th. Because on the afternoon of April 16th, 1945, the Red Sox will catch a train to New York where they will open up the season, 1945, against the Yankees. But on the morning of April 16th, the story breaks. And it's broken by a a white sports writer, Dave Egan, of the old Herald American. And he writes it on the front page. And it's kind of like as a um, kind of as a, uh, a, a letter to Boston sports fans. And he says, you're not aware of it. But at this hour, there are three qualified Negro, as he wrote, ball players who have been marooned in a Boston hotel room for a week, having been promised a tryout by your Boston Red Sox, who are now trying to skip town. Well, the Red Sox realized they got to have this tryout. So they called up Muchnick. They told him to get the players over here. They trooped over to Fenway Park. They suited up. They took the field. They ran the bases, took some batting practice. Less than an hour later, they were called off the field. Uh, Joe Cronin thanked them all very much. He told them the Red Sox will be in touch. None of them ever heard from the Red Sox the rest of their natural lives. But you know who was playing rapt attention that morning, a little bit further south of Boston in Brooklyn? Branch Rickey. Because Branch Rickey was getting reports that of all things and of all people, Tom Yawkey, who he loathed, by the way, uh, was trying out Jackie Robinson, who Branch Rickey secretly already had a plan in place for over a year to break the color barrier. Now, we know if we could have gone back, back in time, we could have told Tom, you know, to, told Branch Rickey, no worries, don't worry about it. You've got plenty of time because it's going to take Tom Yawkey 14 more years to break the color barrier. But he didn't know that. So as soon as the Negro League season ended in September 1945, Jackie Robinson was whisked to Brooklyn where he signed a contract right there for the Dodgers' top minor league team in Montreal, the Montreal Royals. And then just two years later, almost to the day of the sham tryout in Boston, wearing number 42 as he strode out to his position at first base, amid the din of cheering fans, of broadcasters announcing history, and of exploding flashbulbs capturing it, I submit there were also two inaudible sounds at Ebbets Field that day. The sound of a wall falling and the sound of a cheering that could not be heard with the ear, only with the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were there just the same. Moses Fleetwood Walker didn't live to see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, he couldn't even imagine it. He was there. Bud Fowler, somebody who we've seen travel the entire Western Hemisphere just to play baseball. Today, he was in Brooklyn. The Pullman Porter, some of them that very morning rolling along the rails on their way north or south or west in view of Ebbets Field. They were there. The Negro Leaguers, past and present, those who realized they were too old and come too early, and those who were young enough to imagine that they too might now walk through the wall. They were there. And the African-American veterans of the war just ended, and those who had indeed given their lives in it. They were there. On this momentous day, A ball game was played before a crowd, both present and cheering, and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched the game, and they watched the terrible wrong being finally righted. To be sure, even as a black ball player bounded onto an otherwise all-white field, racism was still alive and well in Brooklyn and clear on across America. So many other barriers remained in place. Sadly, many still are. But on this day, some of the hurt and the humiliation seemed to be salved. On this day, hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out seemed to be magically redeemed. On this day, the long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn, where it touched down on the dirt and the grass of a creaky old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And in the bottom of the seventh inning, right there, when Jackie Robinson laid down a perfect bunt and raced toward first base, he was not alone. That invisible crowd was running right alongside him, willing him on. And as Robinson sprinted safely onto second base and caught his breath, they exhaled with him. After all, it had been a long, uncertain 60-year journey, and they helped him get there. The next Dodger batter doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
So, thank you very much. Thank you. Now it can disappear for all I care. But, uh, <laughs> however, uh, if anybody has a quick question, uh, happy to take a quick question, uh, or two. Um, there's so few people, everybody could have one question. But no pressure. But uh, if anybody has a question, yeah. Why not you ever hear about Walker? How about uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker? That's a great question. That's part of why I wanted to write the book, because I, I felt the same way. How come we don't know? But I mean, I mean, think about it this way, right? There you go. Think about it this way. Jackie Robinson wore number 42. Number 42 has been retired but now by every single Major League Baseball team. It happened in the 90s. It will never be worn by another Major League Baseball player. Jackie Robinson wasn't even the first black player to play Major League Baseball. And Walker, as you put it so well, is never heard from. No one even knows who he is. So that, that's a, uh, listen, I only, I share your feeling about that. It, it is a little bewildering, uh, but that's a big part of why I wanted to write the book. I just felt that some of these people, including people like the Porters, including people like Bud Fowler, you know, people should know about who these people are. People should know. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Why don't you talk about something that, uh, when you went to Cincinnati, that's a good story. Oh, about the, the Cincinnati Redlegs. Yes, yes, yes. That was uh, that was Rube Foster who was pitching, and the uh, and the Cincinnati team lost all three games. Right. But but um, the crowd was was jeering, you know, and calling names to. Uh, they would. They would. But Jackie playing first base. And oh, you mean? Oh, oh. I'm sorry. You you're talking about Jackie Robinson's first. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm talking about. Jackie. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I apologize. So Yes. 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 That's a that's a great that was a great moment. Yeah. That was a great moment. That was one of the games early on in that in 1947 when the uh, the abuse that Jackie Robinson was taking on the field was 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 really horrible, and uh, his teammate uh, Pee Wee Reese, who was a Southerner, um, came out. Robinson was on first base, and he came out and he put his arm around uh, Jackie Robinson. That that is a powerful moment. Another kind of tribute. When I was at Cooperstown, and Jack um, Pee Wee Reese's plaque says that he was the one, he wanted that on his plaque, that he was the one that defended Jack Yes. Robinson. Tells you something about the kind of guy Pee Wee Reese yeah. was. He was a good guy. Not, but by the way, you know, not all of Jackie Robinson's teammates, even on the Brooklyn Dodgers, were happy about him, his being on the team. That's, you know, so it makes Pee Wee Reese's you know, feelings that much even more courageous because he wasn't only defending Jackie Robinson to abusive fans in Cincinnati, he was also defending Jackie Robinson to his white teammates who felt that uh, he was somehow, you know, not true to his teammates. So, so Pee Wee is a great figure, great figure. So listen, I want to thank you very much. Who's going to lead me home? Oh. Which, <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I have, I have a better GPS now. Yeah, right. This guy goes like this. <laughs> Thank you. That'll help. Um, <laughs> no, I have great confidence I'll be home by morning. But um, uh, no, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I'm glad we got this in because a week ago tonight, we didn't. So I appreciate you coming out. Um, if anybody's interested in a book, I do have copies of the book here with me. I'd be happy to sign one for you. You'll have to buy it first. But um, thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.